Good evening and welcome to Between the Lines. I'm John Madison. My guest tonight is Dr. Don Pinnock. He's a journalist, photographer, criminologist, environmentalist, and, and travel writer. He's written 17 books, but we're here to talk about his book, Gang Town, which is about Cape Town, which he describes uh, in a way we all recognize as two separate cities, two very different lives. Um, welcome, Don. Hi. So tell us, what is the scope of the problem of gangs in Cape Town? Not quite what you'd imagine, John, you know. Um, Everybody talks about gangs in the newspapers. They are the shocker, the high death rate, the high violence rates. <clears throat> what I found is that what we have in Cape Town is a youth problem of which gangs are part. And that youth problem is much bigger. Uh, if you take just murder, Cape Town is one of the highest violent cities in the world. There's six murders a day, um, 11 attempted murders, 84 uh, uh, reported assaults. There's probably about three times that many. But if you look at just the murder rate, gangs are responsible for about 11%. The rest is domestic violence, largely domestic violence. So when I started writing this book, I was focusing on ki gangs, kids in gangs. And I, it's scope creep. What really happened is I started looking at a much bigger issue. The problem of youth in this country is a real crisis. You know, 3.4 million, 3 .4 million kids in this country are not in school, between the ages of 11 and 24, are not in school, not in jobs, and not in training. They're in the streets, John. You know, that's the big problem. If you look at Cape Town alone, there are 317,000 kids in that situation. They're not anywhere. Of what's course they're going to join gangs. Why? What's, why aren't they in school? Well, the dropout rate of school in this country is about 50% before kids get to matric. That's the first thing. And the second thing is, I think the school's boring. I really think we're failing in terms of not just our way of teaching, but what we're teaching. We're not holding kids' attention. Kids get to matric and they go, well, um, you know, everybody I know with matric hasn't got a job, so why bother? Um, but what's really happening, I think, and it's a problem all over the world, is that we're teaching um, kids from the neck up. We're teaching a very intellectual kind of education system. It's very old and, and, and very silly. I want to come back to the, to the education system uh, uh, later in the discussion. But before we get there, I, I'd like to explore a little bit more about um, the, the kids and the gangs. Um, first of all, the gangs I discovered from your, from your book uh, are very tightly linked into the prison gangs. That's an interesting weave. Um, the prison gangs are very old. They're probably more than 100 years old. And they were very military, very tight, and only in the prisons. Very well known, and 26s and 27s and 28s. Yeah, yeah. And very violent. And once you came out of prison, that was the end of the gangs. But what started happening is that after 94, the, uh, the international syndicates moved in. Any country that's in transition, transnational crime comes So it was in. globalization crime. meant globalization Absolutely. Crime I mean, we, we were at a transit in Cape Town between East and West. We were a container city. Uh, the gangs, everybody was here. The mafia was here, the Moroccans, the Russians, the, 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 the South Americans, the Tongs from China, a whole range of them. They moved in here. And of course, the drug trade was a big issue. Uh, the local gangs were always territorial. They were just, you know, Mannenberg, and then there, there, there was chapters of the Americans' gang or the hard livings at various places. And they suddenly sound, found themselves um, pushed into a corner, and they started organizing, they started organizing um, a, an organization called CORE to try and get them together. There were very, various attempts to get them together. And I think what happened, as far as I can work out, is that a lot of these guys were going to prison, seeing the structure, the military structure of the prison gangs, and they were bringing it back out, and they were, they were imbuing the street gangs with this knowledge. And, the, and they could use this to fight off the foreign gangs? Absolutely, that was about, and they won, they won. I mean, the streets are controlled by local gangs. They pushed the uh, international gangs to the peripheries. They, they, they moved into other things, like Rhino Horn and um, uh, uh, probably car theft and stuff like that. We, we pay for drugs with stolen cars, we pay for it with abalone, we don't want to pay for it with money. But the foreign drug gangs are still here. They became the suppliers. 
So, so they've actually worked out a, a modus vivendi between the, the local gangs and the foreign gangs. Yeah, there are a couple of uh, Central European, like Croatia and people, who've moved in. And you, we keep hearing these, these unpronounceable names, um, but they're very peripheral. The, the real core, still in Cape Town particularly, uh, are still the local gangs, the hard livings, the, you know, the Americans, gangs like that. But now I want to go back to what you said was at the, at the root of the problem, which is youth that are unemployed. Uh, um, um, and part of the problem, we're going to come to education a little later, but part of the problem is, 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 is the drugs and the impact on, uh, in transmission from mother to child. Yes, that's a, that's a double question that needs a double answer. Yes. The issue is drugs, and we can talk about what we do about drugs and why they're a problem. The, the mother-to-child transmission uh, is a problem that emerged. I didn't expect to have to get into that kind of stuff dealing with gangs. But um, what I discovered is that if the mother is, is uh, malnourished, and, and uh, probably 24% of all the mothers in the city are malnourished when they're pregnant, um, if they're taking drugs, if they're smoking, if they're drinking, it has a particular effect on the kid. But what really interested me is what was that effect? How did that happen and what was the result of that? And it's, it, it, it forced me to spend three months studying epigenetics, which I'm, you know, I'm not a scientist, but and epigenetics is very new. Um, but it's, but it, what it means simply is that you get father and mother's DNA into the cell. But you get a third factor, which we haven't noticed before, and that is the influence, the chemical influence to the cell wall that tells the cell wall to get the proteins inside to make something in the DNA, make a brain, make an eye, make... So what we've suddenly realized is that the immediate moment has a huge impact on how we create that kid. And what's the effect on the kid? What it, it's not damage, it's basically saying that you're going to have a tough life, it's going to be rough out there, so there's certain things you have to have. High energy, high dopamine, high levels of aggression to survive. And does that uh, damage, their, is, is that have an impact on the dropout rate from schools? It, yeah, well, it does, of course, but it has an impact on the levels of violence. Uh, you know, I think that the core of the gangs in Cape Town is actually a health issue. A, a prenatal and early postnatal health issue, among many other things. Um, and these kids have lowered concentration levels. Uh, they have higher predisposition to taking stimulants. They're, they're, you know, they, they're different kinds of kids in a certain way. And that doesn't predispose them to this neck up school kind of education, education long term goal stuff. We have to take a break. This is fascinating. We'll be right back with Don Pinnock. And we're back with Dr. Don Pinnock for a fascinating discussion about a side of Cape Town that we need to understand better. Don, I want to ask you a question I ask a lot of people on this show, and that is, how much does the government understand of this problem that you've been investigating? It's very different to know who the government is in this case, because there's so many. Are we talking about the police? Are we talking about the education system? Are we talking about the politicians in general understanding the size of the problem. And there's the Cape Town issue. You know, there's a DA issue down here. Do you, do you put large amounts of money into supporting a city that's not on side? Um, so I don't, uh, you, you, the big problem for me has been the police issue, really. I think that there are cops, people like Jeremy Vary, uh, General Vary, who's got into trouble actually recently, shouldn't got into trouble. He's terrific. He really understands what's going on. But I think that there's just not enough uh, support to go around. I don't think there's sufficient understanding of the problem. I, I, I don't think we're putting enough effort into an understanding and dealing with kids, young people. Um, and into, you know, if you have unemployment, there, there are 5.4 million households in this country in which nobody is working at all. Uh, that's a huge number. Well, let's talk about the education problem. What is it you're saying is wrong? I mean, my, my, my sense of the history in the early days of the democratic government is uh, uh, there was a decline in the apprenticeship system and the technical uh, training systems and the t even teachers' colleges. And so we were training people less 
for what we needed, what, where, the, for where the jobs actually are. You know, we need to build a country with our hands and our minds. And we, 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 we educate for mental intelligence, but not hand intelligence, which is a, a very special And we've made it less prestigious. It, uh, when we moved into the new South Africa, everybody wanted to have, there was, it was their right to have a university education. But that is not always the best and only education, particularly in a developing country. Um, I mean, I foresee a future where factories are people sitting at keyboards. They're the factory workers. The people making the money actually build your cars, fix your sinks, build your houses, put the roof on. They'll be the people with skills, but we're not training for skills in this country. You know, I, I was one of the dumb kids in class. I did the woodwork and the metalwork. All my bright friends went off when they did the, the fancy stuff, the Latin. I went to school because I was building things. I went to school because I loved working on lathes, working in, with wood. That holds you in a different way to this hard education. So, we should be doing that. So what happened, uh, uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but just to understand post-1994, there was a decline in, in, in the training in these areas, wasn't there? There's a massive decline. Why? I, I don't know why we stopped the apprenticeship system. We, we sort of Was that a government it. decision? I think it was a government decision, yes. Um, mm. Various things were put in place, but the result was that the apprenticeship went down and we got to vet colleges. We got these, these training colleges. Because we're now, we're now uh, producing uh, graduates, for instance, uh, if you're a graduate in law from Turfloop, some of the, uh, the uh, formerly Bundestan area universities, even people with, with uh, professional degrees like law struggle to get jobs. Yeah. And yet uh, um, uh, we have this need. I mean, there's a shortage of jobs in some areas. There's a huge shortage of jobs in the areas in which people actually do things. <clears throat> we're a developing country. We desperately need to build things. We need to create things. And we're getting people who want to sit at desks, sit at computers, and think about things. And that's the importance of manufacturing. But so, so uh, um, at the highest le levels of government, at the national cabinet and maybe some of the provincial ones, do they understand this? Has this conversation happened? You know, I'm parochial, John. I've stayed in Cape Town for particular reasons. I've dug deep down into Cape Town. Right. I'm not sure what they think at the top, if they think at all. Any, do they think about it anywhere in government, local level? Provincial? You know, yes. Uh, things get together around youth. The police will put together a, a, a manifesto that they work with youth, but it doesn't go anywhere. Well, it's got to be higher than the police, surely. Well, I, I'm just, I, that's the area I know. Yes. I, I know the education department. I'm part of processes around trying to solve the gang problem in schools, but it's all provincial. All my contacts have been provincial. I've had no national contacts at all. But, 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 but it, 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 when you talk to people in government, do they understand that this is the problem and are they trying to adjust our, 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 our funding, our budgets, to deal with the problem? They are at a provincial level. And I do not know what they're doing at a national level and neither does the province know what they're doing at a national level. So there's no coordinate or lack there, of coordination. There's, there's a silo problem here. Yeah. Everybody's in their silo and they're not cooperating. Is that ways. partly because of the different political parties, ANC, national, DA, re, uh, provincial? Not that? only. I think it is. That's a partly. factor. But, you know, the Department of Social Development doesn't work with the Department of, you know, th this and that. And, and it eventually these things are not connecting together. That's a big problem. So somehow over... I mean, if we're going to turn this country around, this is a key part of the solution. And it, uh, I wish I could say it was something that could happen overnight and civil society could get together. But, but the truth is we haven't really developed um, a civil society clarity on how to, how to get there. But this seems to be one part of it. We haven't developed a national understanding of the crisis of youth in this country. And we're not doing anything about it. Well, we have a youth... The presidency has a youth council. Yeah, sure. Now, you know, I'm not sure what they're doing. I don't hear about it. I work with youth all the time in this province. I hear nothing of national or what they're doing. Well, I can't be sure that this is the case, but it seems, when one looks at it from the outside, that it's yet another patronage 
uh, uh, situation where uh, President Zuma has people who support him. They, I mean, when I meet them, they have very nice motor cars and so on, and they show up for events that have a usually a political dimension to them. Uh, but they're not. They're not. They're not calling you up. When, when this book came out, you didn't get the, youth co the uh, President's Youth, youth uh, Council calling you and saying, we have to understand this. <laughs> no, I didn't. Yeah. No, I didn't. You know, the flip side of that, I spend a lot of time in Nyanga and uh, Hanover Park and places like that. And I just get angry at how they're being neglected. You ask me what the National is doing. They're not there. That's the, what I know. They're not yeah. there. They're not doing what they should be doing. Yeah. In education, um, in social development, in, in health, in uh, structure, in housing, and all those things. There are bits and pieces going on, but we haven't got to the problem yet. It seems, it seems like what's needed is quite a major uh, reorientation of government, and that's going to have to happen, um, and we're going to have to help make it happen. We need to break, and we'll be right back. And we're back with Dr. Don Pinnock talking about his fascinating book, Gang Town. I want to go on to the question of drugs, and I must say I was very interested to see your approach to drugs, and I had some background to it because when I was in the, at the University of Chicago, I, um, I started looking just for really as an outsider, and I was struck by the fact of how many people at the highest levels, even in conservative places in American politics, believed that, that the, drug, the war on drugs was an utter failure and that the reverse had to happen, that you had to ha decriminalize uh, drugs. That doesn't mean you encourage them or legalize them necessarily, and we can talk about that, but that you have to decriminalize them because the criminalization of, of drugs uh, creates so many other crimes. If it makes them expensive, it brings the gangs in to sell them, and then uh, addicts uh, will, will do anything for the next fix. You, you're also tackling, you, I mean, you're tackling this question too. You're, ask, you're, you're saying that the war on drugs doesn't work and that we need a new approach and it's that a, there are people who've done it. Look, it's, the war on drugs is a complete failure. There's a story, it might not be true, but I think it probably is, that when America was working out to start the war on drugs, the, the, the legislation, the mafia came along and offered to give them money to actually criminalize drugs. Because if you do that, you hand it over to organized crime. Um, and then organized crime, you have no control over it. So, uh, you know, Cape Town, South Africa has, they estimate um, the throughput of illegal drugs in South Africa is around 23 billion a year. That's how much the, we are handing to the criminal syndicates. Um, if we don't take back that, um, they're going to grow and they're going to continue. And their interest is to addict kids or addict people. You, you can take drugs for a long time without getting addicted. The war on drugs says immediately you take a drug, you're addicted. That's rubbish. Um, but people can get addicted, and, and it's in the interests of the criminal underworld to addict them. We have to decriminalize them so we can call back control. We take back control. In your book, you, you gave the example of Portugal. I, I, I was aware of the Netherlands. I wasn't in, in, aware of Portugal. Uh, Portugal is much more interesting than the Netherlands. It's yes. much more recent. In 2002... The government said, look, we've got a problem with drugs, um, but the problem is not the drugs, it's something else. And they decriminalize drugs. You can have 10 days supply of anything. If you have more than that, they, they'll, they'll pick you up and they'll take you in, not to a police station, but to a specialist who'll say, what is your problem that requires you to take drugs? Because what they discovered is that one of the main causes for people taking drugs is sadness. It's something in their life that's not working for them, and the drug is the chemical hug. Very logical. So they work with the sadness, they work with those problems. Portugal now has the, one of the lowest drug abuse uh, statistics in the world. And they've decriminalized, in, in, uh, as drugs. you describe. Does that put the ga gangs out of business? Well, you see, if you did that in Cape Town, you'd, you'd collapse the turf wars, because the turf wars are, are all about territory, and territory is about where you sell the drugs. It collapsed the syndicates. It would collapse the international uh, transit uh, systems. And all of that, you have to have a good system that is an alternative, a state system like Portugal that deals with it as a medical 
and psychological issue and not as a drug issue. Does it also include uh, giving drugs to addicts? Um, that's, that's, a, that's a very strong possibility. There are places in the States where they actually give them the drugs so that they have them there. And, and they can deal with those people. They, and and it's one be, of the there'll strategies. be clean needles and so yeah, on, and presumably linked to some kind of program to, yeah, to graduate. Yeah, that's one of the strategies. But, but if we continue to criminalize drugs, we're going to have more than a... We've got a disaster already, John. I don't want to uh, dwell on the, the government too much, but, but uh, how, how... I mean, you know, the interesting thing about Helen Sussman, uh, people forget not only was she opposed to apartheid and fighting for the rule of law and so on, but she was very progressive on the issue of drugs. And the, I remember in the apartheid parliament... The uh, National Party ministers used to sneer at her and say, oh, you just want to take Dacha. And she said, I've never taken it in my life, but I've just read the research. Um, it makes sense to decriminalize. Mm. And not because of the drug, but because of the issue of uh, it, it attracts the underworld, basically. Yes, I understand. But, but um, uh, are there people in government who understand? I mean, we have such a good Minister of Health. He must have some sense of this issue. You know, I, uh, some very high-level people have said, you're right, you're right, you have to do that. Right. Um, I mean, uh, Jeremy Vary was on the front page of the Cape Times saying we have to decriminalize drugs. Yes. Uh, he did seem to lose his job shortly after. I hope it wasn't anything to do with that. Yes, but I thought that was very courageous. I think that was very courageous. And, and, and you know, I talked to a lot of uh, police with lots of stuff on their shoulders, a whole batch of them, and they were all agreeing with me. They're saying, look... The drugs, we can't control the issue. It's not our issue. It's a social issue. We expect it to solve it, but it should be solved down the line. We can't not be it can't be solved by the police because we it's can't a solve social gangs. Issue. We can't solve the dra drugs issue, but we're being asked to. And the only way to deal with it, if we're asked to, is up violence. It's forcing the police to be more violent because we're expecting them to do what they cannot do. Am I right in sensing that none of the opposition parties or, or none of the major <coughs> ones? Or have really grasped this fact either? I don't think they have. I think, I think we're at the beginning of that, but I think it needs to grow. And, and so what's really needed, it, it, it's not just an ANC problem, it's not just a DA problem. Uh, our political class has to be educated in, in the need for this. Our people need to be educated to not think that as soon as you have a drug, you have an addiction, as soon as you have that, you have a criminal that needs to go to jail. Yes. Half the people in jail are probably there in relation to drugs. Yeah. Half, and, the, the courts are, are filled up with people related to drugs. It's, it's clogging up the system. We've I mean, got the, to educate the public. And of course that's what explains the, the high uh, uh, imprisonment rate in the United States too. Yeah, absolutely. And, and of course it might sound like a radical solution, but the interesting thing is uh, there is a history of this prohibition that was the same thing for, for alcohol in the 20s in the United States that created the gangs and so on. And when they decriminalized it, uh, those kind of gangs had to get into, get into another business. Well, you don't, business. you don't have kids on the street in America now with guns selling whiskey. Yes. You know, that's not an, it's a non-issue. Um, we could make that a non-issue with drugs. Yeah. Well, Don, this has been fascinating. I, I think we have to somehow find a way to, to get the church leaders, to get the business leaders, the labor leaders, uh, all other es elements of civil society reading your book and having this kind of discussion. The book is Gangtown. Uh, that's what it looks like. I strongly recommend it. Uh, that's it for me. Good night and good reading. Good reading.